What's interesting about today's build is not just that it's among the fastest that money can buy or that it's all AMD, CPU and GPU, but also that it manages to use among the largest CPU coolers on the market, a full-sized ATX motherboard, and yet the whole case, the whole packaging for the case is only this big. Meet the Lian Li O11 Dynamic Mini, the tiny case that can fit almost anything inside it. And this video is brought to you by Ting. Ting is a customer focused mobile provider and they have new rates to help you save even more on your monthly service plan. Learn more at the end of the video or by checking out the link below. Given then that the main focus of this build is in fact the case, I'm just gonna go ahead and clear all this other stuff off the table. We've got an installation guide. You might actually wanna check out their video installation guide as well because it can be a little bit tricky. A whack ton of brackets. We've got one for extending the motherboard tray, facing out the back panel, pump mount or something. More brackets. That wasn't enough brackets already. Screws, cable ties, and all of that good stuff. As we'd expect from Lee and Lee, the case is made predominantly out of aluminum, so you can see. Got my little magnet here, it doesn't stick. And it being 2020, it uses tempered glass panels in both the front and side. Of course, that doesn't mean that they've skimped on airflow. It was built in collaboration with renowned overclocker Der Bauer, and Lee and Lee advertises <clears throat> adequate airflow. And I tend to believe them. They've got fan mounts over here. They've got the ability to mount fans in the top, in the bottom. You can basically fill this thing with fans and or radiators, depending on how much other hardware you want to stuff inside it. The biggest reconfigurable portion of the case, and this is really innovative, is the back panel. So you can see out of the box, it's designed to take a full-sized ATX motherboard. That is freaking cool, given the size of it. I mean, this the whole case is barely as tall as an ATX motherboard. But, of course, that's gonna come with some compromises. If you do that, you're not gonna be able to easily fit a radiator in the top, for example. So if you don't like that option, you wanna go, uh, let's say, MATX, you can go ahead, pop these out, pop a spacer in here, move the whole thing down, and now you've got a ton of clearance at the top for going water cooling. So cool, look at that. They've got these ferrous metal strips on either side of these perforations. That allows you to mount a magnetic fan filter, or if you really wanted to, an RGB strip. We won't be using it, but despite its diminutive size, the case does allow three and a half inch hard drives to be installed. And what's more, they're actually accessible oh, via this cover at the back. This is one of the really nice things about these cube style cases is once you get all the panels off of them, holy smokes, do you ever have a ton of room to work. Ah! <laughs> oh, that's what happens. You got a big nose. You get a little whack there when you drop some. This is a motherboard tray expansion. It's configured by default for a mini ITX motherboard with the assumption that you're gonna fill it with hardline water cooling hardware or something along those lines. But we are going for as many expansion slots as we can. One of the nice things is that Lee and Lee considered not just the radiator element of water cooling, but also where to mount the pump and they included a modular pump bracket. A plus, good job guys. Now, before we start installing the rest of the components, I wanna talk about the last thing that allows this case to be so compact without compromising expansion. And that's the fact that it takes an SFXL power supply. I am a big fan of these power supplies. They are just as small in the X and Y dimension as an SFX power supply, but they're slightly deeper, which allows them to take a 120 millimeter fan. Now it's still a slim 120 millimeter fan, meaning it's not as quiet as a thicker one because it just can't generate enough static pressure unless it spins faster, but it is a great compromise between SFX and ATX and you can get them in like crazy configurations now. Look at this. This is an 800 watt fully modular power supply that's this skinny. So that is what keeps the thickness of the case down slash allows it to have nice tall graphics cards. Like you could probably put an RTX 3090 in this thing if you could find one. Enough case talk. Let's move on to the meat and potatoes. 
you don't have to spend a ton of money to get a fully featured X570 board that's gonna allow you to get the most out of your Ryzen 5000 CPU. This one here has four memory slots, decent VRM for overclocking, USB 3.1 front panel support. It's got two M.2 slots that both run at PCI Express Gen 4 speeds, and it even has support for NVIDIA SLI and Crossfire. For our CPU, we've gone with the sensible, but still very high-end Ryzen 9 5900X. This is the only one in our entire office, so as soon as I'm done with this build, I will be promptly taking it back apart and giving it back to Anthony so that he can use it on his GPU test bench. Da, 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 da. For RAM, we've gone full bore. This is 64 gigs of G-Skill Trident Z Neo 3600 megahertz CL16. So that's about as high as you're gonna go before you start getting into pretty darn pricey DRAM. Now, as for whether you wanna go four sticks or two sticks. If you're going for absolute maximum speeds, yeah, two sticks is what you want, but this is more of a like kitted out machine. So we're going for capacity. Now we can take care of M.2 storage. Of course, we've gone with the ever fancy Rocket NVMe 4.0. This is a two terabyte model from Sabrent and it comes with a gigantic heatsink. The assembly process for this guy is pretty straightforward. You just peel the thermal tape at the bottom, put this puppy right here. This is if you have a double-sided drive, like the one that we have. So that is, there's uh, flash chips on the other side. Gotta keep those not cool, but cool enough. Then there's already a pre-applied thermal pad on the bottom of the heat sink. So we just take that, plonk it on top. Then we pop the M.2 uh, into the slot and it's a little tricky with that heat pipe in the way I installed it backwards. Oh man. See, there's three heat pipes on this side and two on this side, so it's easier to screw it in. Now, because I don't feel like putting an OS on the you know, drive we're using for the build, <clears throat> I'm just gonna chuck my test bench drive down here. Do, 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 do. Shh, you never saw anything. Uh, it's gen three, oh no, boo, hiss. Time to put a heat sink on this puppy. Now you're probably thinking, gee Linus, an NHD 15 Chromax Black? Really? In that compact case? And I would reply, yes. Weren't you paying attention before? Here's a really important tech tip. If you have a heat sink that doesn't use the original mounting bracket, please, Please keep it safe. You'll need it if you ever RMA your motherboard or if you change out your cooler to one that does use it. So we're only using the back plate, which means I'm gonna put the rest of this into the box. Hi. Oh, that is some good cat butt roll, butthole B-roll there. He's happy that you're upset I put too much on. I'm only installing one of the fans here. That is purely for looks, no other reason. You can also save a buck and get the S version of this heat sink that only comes with the one fan. Now we just gotta plug in the fan. Uh. Now it's time for the moment of truth where we make sure that all this stuff actually fits. The standoffs for the motherboard expansion piece are pre-installed. So you don't even have to deal with that. That is sweet. Not bad at all. Okay, while my intention was to use 120 millimeter fans, <laughs> the ones Jake sent me appear to be the ones that were on the roof of the old office as part of whole room water cooling, so they're absolutely filthy. I guess we're going with 140 mils. So we can fit two of them as intakes over here. Those will also dry air over the power supply and the hard drives. And then two of them, and I guess I'll go intakes for those as well, down here on the bottom. We do have two more mounts at the top. And these feet are super clever. They've got another slot in them over here for the fan filter to slide in. Love it. Oops. There's definitely a little bit of trickiness getting at the cable management at the back until, well, hopefully this is it anyway, you remove this two and a half inch drive mount. There we go. It seems like the 24 pin on this Silverstone power supply has a second four pin coming off of it that looks to be like a, for the secondary CPU power connector. I guess I'll just try it. Um, there's a separate eight pin that's gonna provide most of the power for the CPU anyway, so I'm not worried that it's gonna brick anything, mostly. It's just a really weird thing to do. Why 
break the standard in that manner. Okay. This is where the build gets disorganized. I can't have the fan cables up here kind of bent a certain way and get a 140 mil fan in here, but we did get it in. Now, finally, after much waiting and cable management, it's time for the graphics card. We've gone with a 6800 XT, kind of the second down from the top of the line to match our CPU, making this not a bang for the buck machine by any stretch of the imagination, but an extreme performance machine without spending way too much for only a small additional performance gain. And this is actually my first hands-on with an ASRock graphics card. They became an AMD board partner, I wanna say a couple of years ago. My goodness, this thing is an absolute monster, isn't it? HDMI 2.1, dual display ports, USB type C, three cooling fans. If it was me, I might have just put a bigger cooling fan in the middle rather than this kind of decorative uh, fascia piece here, but it's, it's not up to me. And look at that. They've actually got a built-in switch so you can turn the LEDs on and off. Naturally, we'll be leaving the LEDs on because we want the full performance of this card and everyone knows you need RGB for that. PCI Express Gen 4, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Like they're not short enough for it to be tidy to plug them straight into the same card and they're not long enough to get them out of the way. I'm not impressed with these cables. Okay, are we done? I wasn't kidding when I said that back plane's not as strong as a one piece one. There we go. You can peel off the plastic too if you'd like. That's the best part. Ow! Working on the setup here, naturally. Got my LTTstore.com Northern Lights mouse pad. All right, I'm finally in game. The system's not loud and all that time spent fan tuning cost me was missing Marquez's birthday. Didn't even send a tweet and now he's probably sleeping. It also cost me a lot of time. You can see it is dark outside. So happy birthday Marquez and I'm sorry my children for not spending any time with me. But hey, the good news is I'm playing Doom Eternal at 4K ultra details at 170 to 200 FPS on all AMD. All right, I wanna see what kind of temps we get and then we can call it here. I'm just gonna beat all these baddies and leave this running in this room so that it'll heat up. Or not heat up. See how it goes. I'm back. This has been running for a couple of hours now. So let's go ahead and tab out. Seriously, hardware info wasn't running this whole time? Oh, for crying out loud. 67 max. Dang! Huh. Oh, hotspot temperature, 85 max. Oh, that's right. That's an AMD feature that allows them to take the temperature of exactly the hottest point of the die and use that to throttle their turboing behavior. RGPU clock, uh, minimum, just shy of 2.1 gigahertz. Dang. As for the CPU, we maxed out at 82.6 degrees and that's with the fan speeds locked, so not allowing them to ramp up for maximum cooling. All in all, not a bad little machine given how small it is and the fact that we stuck with air cooling. I'd be interested to see what we could do with this thing with a water loop now. And the power supply doesn't ramp up too bad while it's going ham. Freaking love it. Just like I love telling you guys about our sponsors. Sponsors like Ting Mobile. Ting Mobile has new rates that make it easier to see how much you can save by switching. They've got unlimited talk and text for 10 bucks, data plans that start at $15 and unlimited data for 45. And if you liked their previous pay for what you use plans, they're still there. They're called Ting Flex and they start at just $5 per gigabyte. Data can even be shared if you've got a family plan so you can connect more phones to save more. You'll still get nationwide coverage in the US and their award-winning service and pretty much any phone will work with Ting. So check them out at linus.ting.com and get a $25 credit. If you guys enjoyed this video and you love just seeing Team Red gaming machines that are super powerful, you might also enjoy the one where we uh, opened one up from Digital Storm that's literally the fastest gaming machine that you can get.